Hello, my name is Stein Brucke. I am a senior economist at the OECD where I lead the organization's Future Work Initiative. We have recently engaged in a new and exciting program of work to better understand what impact artificial intelligence will have on the labor market. Will it further automate jobs? And if so, which ones? Will it improve job quality or worsen it? What would the ethical concerns that have been raised? And what will it mean for disparities in the labor market? Will we be able to harness the opportunities that AI offers to reduce inequalities? Or will we instead see inequality rise even further? To try and find out more about what impact AI will have on the labor market, I'm speaking to a number of experts to try and learn from what their own research has shown so far. My guest today is Professor Gina Neff from the Oxford Internet Institute and the Department of Sociology at the University of Oxford. Professor Neff studies the future of work in data-rich environments, and she currently leads a multinational comparative research project on the effects of the adoption of AI across multiple industries. Professor Neff, thank you very much for accepting to speak to us and to share your insights. Let me start with the first question. Your work focuses on the adoption of AI by companies. What, according to you, is the biggest mistake that companies can make when adopting AI? Thank you, Stan. Uh, we did a study of how the news media covered AI in businesses over the two, uh, 2019, 2020 period. And um, in this kind of multinational corpus of news articles, we found that the same kinds of failures kept popping up in story after story, in country after country. And one of the biggest ones was around transparency. Now in, in, in our work on AI and data um, governance, we talk about algorithmic transparency. Do we know how the algorithm is working, what it's doing? What we see with companies is, is, is one step behind that. They're not transparent about when AI is working in their business model and when it's not. So companies, clients, customers do not understand when they're looking at results that have been parsed um, by a human or results that have been parsed by AI. Th th this comes into to pretty serious problems because um, some companies are touting their services to make new apps for app stores, make new kinds of bits of software for, for companies as being AI applications when really it's a new form of outsourcing. The work is just simply happening in another um, uh, economy where the labor prices are, are lower. So that was one. The second really is in these big chains of um, uh, supply chains of AI. So we think about um, AI as being something that's really high tech and it takes the best engineers in the world to make. Well, okay, maybe that's true. But most of these models rely on enormous amount of work, of label, of labor of labeling, of tagging, of sorting, of classifying that happens by human labor. And so where this work is happening is often not transparent to, again, end users and clients, customers, the public. So are my bank records being read, tagged, sorted by people um, far away? Um, is that a practice I want my bank to have, for example? Um, is it how I want my data shared? These are, these are often not transparent, these kind of global supply chains. Um, and then the third is, is, and the third big problem that we see with AI in, in, in most workplaces right now is, is a, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's both over-relied on and under-relied on. So there are many situations where an AI system gets put in place and the workers themselves don't trust it. And so they stop using it. This happened with a group of um, oncologists that were relying on a system trained to give um, state-of-the-art predictive um, uh, uh, medicine insights on particular cancers and, and, and um, uh, particular treatments. And the doctors themselves realized that the system wasn't working as the expectations, as it had been sold. And so they simply stopped using it. Well, the challenge then is that some people in the organization are saying we have these great AI systems and yet it really is a set of doctors who are making making the calls. The reverse can happen too where um, people don't fully understand what the system's doing or why and until they 
it gets too late until, until results get into play. Um, in work that I've been doing with an organization called the Women's Forum for Economy and Society, we have been interviewing the leading data scientists at organizations who are putting in place these kinds of AI systems. And we ask them about these, these problems that there might be in their systems of, of bias. How, how important do they see this work? And they see it's enormously important to make fair, safe, and transparent systems. The challenge is, even at these Fortune 500 companies, even at the largest companies in the world, they don't yet know how to do it. So we have this enormous problem where there's a great amount of hype, there's a great amount of effort and energy being spent in developing these models, and yet how to do it responsibly in the workplace is something we haven't yet addressed. That's extremely interesting, and it kind of brings us on to the next question. You've mentioned issues of trust and transparency and how these technologies are being used by companies. Now, you and I are both at home or uh, working behind a screen at the moment, uh, teleworking. COVID-19 has forced many of us to work from home and has forced companies to think about new ways of working and new ways of, for example, monitoring uh, workers. Um, more generally, are, are you concerned about the use of AI-based tracking technologies? Absolutely. I wrote a book with Don Napis called Self-Tracking. And in this book, we look at how people try to make sense of their own digital tracking technologies. And this book came out before the proliferation of Apple watches and all of these smartwatches and smartphone applications that we all now have um, to track our steps and, and um, you know, monitor how little exercise we're getting in the COVID-19 lockdowns around the world. The challenge is without the sense making that happens from my personal experience, much of that data is meaningless in larger scenarios. So one of the things that really worries me when we bring these kind of tracking technologies into the workplace, especially in these moments where we see that workers are so challenged with so many other things going on in the COVID economy, that the data taken out of a particular context can be devastating. It can, it can damage lives. And so matched with this kind of, you know, we're, we're experimental and we're, we're figuring it out and companies don't quite yet know what to do with the data, what to do with all of this data. Um, when we've gotten an, an environment like that and we've got an environment where workers are really struggling, I worry that companies aren't taking the time and effort to get it right. So it would be one thing, for example, as my um, uh, Oxford collaborator, Balash Vedrish and I have done, it would be one thing to ask, can we use some of this data to see if women at work are being empowered and supported in these networks? Are they missing out on key networking opportunities within organizations? That would be great. And it would be great if that data are then used to help design programs that help workers prosper. The fear is that without support, without worker insight, without key insight from individuals, the data subjects themselves, we're likely to get into a scenario of new kinds of data surveillance at work. And that simply will not help support and develop um, uh, new and better and fairer ways of working. So, so I really worry um, if we don't develop privacy forward technologies in this COVID moment, I really truly worry about what's going to come in the COVID-19 recovery. You mentioned data a few times. One aspect of AI that I guess is sometimes forgotten about is that an awful lot of data work goes into building AI. How does society value that kind of work? Is it undervalued? And if so, how do we address that challenge? With my colleague Nadia Muller at the University of Copenhagen and other collaborators, we've been looking at this question of what we call data work. Now, right now, and forgive me for the sexist metaphor and imagery, but you know, AI and data science are sexy jobs, right? It's like you know, some of the best paid jobs in any economy, um, growing, expanding opportunities. Every company wants to get in on this great new phenomenon, right? 
And yet when you look at organizations trying to build data-driven systems, they rely on an enormous amount of work that uh, needs to go into making the data clean, right? Getting the data ready for analysis. So we studied hospital systems and the often overlooked workers in um, a Danish hospital who, um, whose organization was trying to get rid of them. They were trying to uh, be more efficient. They said, we don't, we don't need to create space in the new hospital for these workers. So we're gonna come up with new ways to, to get this work done without them. And, and you know, lo and behold, when you talk to them, you, you understand when you interview and you get these insights, these in-depth insights that they have about the data systems they're creating, it's these undervalued clerical workers who are the ones without whom there is no AI system in that hospital. It is all dependent on how they input um, the enormous amounts of data into different systems that make it ready to do. So we, we developed a framework and I've included the link for the resources. We've, we've included a, uh, we developed a framework for helping people see who's doing the work of translating that data to the data subjects, to ethical practice, translating it into action, getting it ready for analysis and, and, and helping organizations to identify and understand that that's a critical link in their data supply chain. Yes, it's the mechanical Turk to some extent. Um, Professor Neff, this has been really fascinating. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I would like to thank you once again for the time that you have taken to speak to us. I really look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. I think we're only at the start uh, of the research and, and, and the, uh, the, the whole conversation and the policy implications uh, of AI in the labor market. To all those who've been watching this video, I would like to thank you for the time and for your interest. Please do visit the OECD's Future of Work web, uh, webpage if you would like to find out more about our work, but also about Professor Neff's work. We will be including some of the links, uh, some of the references to her work. Thank you very much and goodbye.